Welcome to the Charleston chapter of the Bobby Jones Chiari Syringo Myelia Foundation. We have um, already had Juliana talk to us about her eye issues, and we're going to have Dr. Hill here give us a lecture. Um, James Hill, he's a native of Georgetown, South Carolina, and graduated from the Citadel in 2003 with the BS in biology. He first worked as a research specialist at MUSC, and he decided during his two years there to pursue a co career in optometry. He attended and graduated from the University of Alabama School of Optometry and completed a residency in ocular disease and low vision rehabilitation at the Birmingham VAMC and Blind Rehabilitation Center. Upon completion of his residency, he completed the Advanced Competency Medical Optometry, ACMO, in other words, examination and obtained his fellowship of the American Academy of Optometry. Over the past five years, he has worked with four different private practices, started a weekly low vision clinic at the Storm Eye Institute at MUSC, and provided eye care in many nursing homes in the Charleston area. He is currently on the board of directors of the Palmetto Professional Society, Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired of South Carolina, and the South Carolina Op Optomic Optometric Physicians Association. In 2016, he was awarded the SCOPA Young Optometrist of the Year, and in, in 2017, accepted a full-time faculty position as an assistant professor at the Storm Eye Institute at MUSC. His duties will also allow him to continue to provide cutting-edge, low-vision research and care to those who are visually impaired, as well as provide comprehensive eye care at the highest level to new patients in the Charleston community. When not in the clinic, Dr. Hill likes to spend time with friends and family, and he is an amazing provider. He takes great care of my mother with her macular degeneration. So I really appreciate Dr. Hill. Welcome. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Nancy. Uh, caveat is Nancy came in and uh, I had a, uh, a resident following me and I went out of the room for about maybe, maybe five minutes. I come back in and they had bonded and they were talking and all of a sudden this whole uh, Kyrie malformation came up and this was supposed to be her project, but only had her for uh, three more weeks, so it got dropped on me. So uh, it's been awesome because I had to go learn about everything and make sure that I knew what we were doing. So we were supposed to do this lecture back in May of 2020. I went back and looked, May 20th of 2020, and obviously a week before that, the, uh, the world changed and we couldn't do anything live. And then we're going to do it in August because we thought it'd be over. And now we're in November a year later, and uh, we get to do it, which is fantastic, albeit with the mask and all. So. Happy to be here. Um, hopefully this will be informative. Uh, that's what it's supposed to be. Obviously, I'm not an expert in Kyari or Ehlers-Danlos, but I do know how it affects the eyes and, and some things that hopefully everybody will leave here knowing a little bit more about um, as far as uh, eye conditions. All right, so. All right, so we'll, you went over all that. So I haven't updated my, uh, my biography since 2017, obviously. Um, so thank you. That was uh, uh, that was good. So now I'm full time at the MUSC. I run the uh, the primary care clinic and the low vision clinic full time now at uh, the medical university here, right across the street. We have five locations. Um, uh, it's full scope. We do, we do a lot. We see a lot of patients. Uh, manage a lot of a lot of conditions, but we do see a lot of what we're going to go over today. So hopefully uh, this will be beneficial. Not getting paid. No financial disclosures. Uh, who likes corny dad jokes? All right, anybody? So we have to have one or two right before we get started. So why did the cellular phone have to wear eyeglasses? Because it lost its contacts. Oh um, yeah. And then why do eye doctors live long lives? Because they dilate eyes. <laughs> All right, so a little cheesiness before we get started. So, uh, but uh, during the lecture, we're going to review kind of what everybody probably already knows a lot about. Um, I'll, I'll go brief because I know that's sort of y'all's bread and butter, but uh, I like to hit it off just because as we talk about anatomy and how it affects the eyes, and hopefully it'll all tie together. 
uh, the pathophysiology certainly of chiari malformation and more of the genetics when it comes to Ehlers-Danlos and collagen disorders. Um, and then obviously the rest of it, we're gonna talk about eye exams, important elements that we're looking for in the clinic, uh, what tests we are doing to help with diagnosis and management, and everyone leave here with a little bit better understanding of symptoms, causes, treatments for the above. So obviously chiral malformation is a structural defect of the inferior area of the brain, both the cerebellum and the brainstem. Um, there's a couple different references in the literature, congenital tonsillar herniation, tonsillar ectopia, and tonsillar descent. Um, I've got some pictures of this, but basically, as we know, there's a, there's a hole in the bottom of the skull called the um, foramen ovale. And if things are pushed into that too much, then it starts to affect everything in the spine and lower. Um, interesting, Chiari malformation was named after Hans Chiari. And we know now that we have great tools such as MRI and stuff to be able to diagnose this, but you think back to 1891, how he was able to sort of understand this back then without any kind of special instrumentation is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and then obviously we have a one through four. Uh, three and four is very rare, um, hard to find a lot in the literature. Obviously it's all about anatomy, so it's not graded one through four based on uh, symptoms or, or the disease process, but more of the anatomy of where things are is how they label these um, chiari malformations. And as you can see, right in the center of that big hole, that's the foramen magnum. Um, as you can see right below that, um, on the picture hopefully it's small enough, but you see the occipital uh, bone. So occipital, you're gonna hear a lot during the lecture because obviously that's where the occipital part of the brain holds the visual cortex, and that affects a lot of what we do in eye care. Um, so a type one is uh, basically uh, in children mostly, but we know people can get diagnosed with this at any stage in life. Um, Usually you're found whenever you're having some form of an event, whether it's uh, um, at a valsava, straining, cough, sneezing is sort of the first symptoms. Um, as you can see, children 40% under the age of 5, 25, 5 to 10, and 30, uh, 10 to 15. So if you add all that up, that's 95% of, of most of it's caught by the age of 15. And it's that pain, that occipital pain, and we'll talk about that with some anatomy slides here in just a minute. And then syringomyelia, explained later, may coexist, which is uh, basically a pocket of fluid that, that um, goes around the spine and does compress around those areas. Um, type two is a little bit more severe. Um, it's onset much younger usually. Um, it's a herniation of not only the cerebellum, but the vermis and the medulla, and also the fourth ventricle, which extends down. And nearly 100% of these patients are going to end up with uh, myelomeningocele, which is spina bifida, and sometimes uh, referred to as the Arnold Chiari, as, as most of you already know. And that does um, usually lead to hydrocephalus. And Juliana didn't mention, but, but, and we'll talk about this, but hydrocephalus a lot of times will lead to uh, intracranial hypertension, which is fluid in the brain pressing up. And that can have devastating consequences when it comes to eye disease and um, how to manage those patients. Um, so we just talked a little bit, oh, we wanna go up, all right, so am I going the right way? There we go. All right, so, so some of the symptoms and signs, well, from the neurologic standpoint, just overall body, that headache, usually number one, neck pain, choking, ringing, nares, dizziness, imbalance, weakness in limbs. On the ocular side, uh, the number one thing you're gonna get is these occipital headaches. And what it is is you have these nerves that run up on the back end of the skull. They're called the occipital nerves, and you have the greater and the lower and when you have compression from the skull and all the tissues coming out past the level of the skull, it's going to touch those nerves and that leads to that back of the neck up through the, the lower head. Um, that pain, and usually that's the first symptom coming in. And, and the diagnosis is usually made from symptoms and then doing scans such as CT, MRI, sign MRI, which we'll talk about. Photophobia is very common, just a symptom of light sensitivity. Uh, we talked about, she, so Juliana talked about diplopia. Well, there's a lot of different reasons that happens, but um, in that area of the midbrain, depending on where it's pressed, you have all your cranial nerves. So three of your cranial nerves are specific to your eyes. Cranial nerve three is going to be your, three, four of the extraocular eye muscles. Um, your, your cranial nerve four, your superior oblique. So if you have an infect there, you're going to end up with the eye turn, or your lateral rectus is cranial nerve six. So those muscles control all. So if any one of those cranial nerves is affected by compression of swelling from the herniation, you're gonna end up with double vision. 
Uh, nystagmus also is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, same way you can get dystonia. Um, so that can happen to anyone with uh, chiral malformation. And then the pain, you got all that inflammation going on for nerve endings, so there's a lot, usually a lot of pain. So just to give you an idea of the anatomy, um, I highlighted on the, on the blue side there, that's your uh, cerebellum, so that's what gets compressed. You can sort of see right underneath it's the skull. So if that gets pressed on into it, but you can also see where it presses into the back. And the occipital lobe here is where your primary visual cortex is. So if you have compression into any part of that brain in the occipital lobe, that can certainly affect all areas of your vision there. So it's all about the anatomy here when we're thinking about how it affects the ocular system uh, from this malformation. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit more about the visual cortex you can see. So if you have, which out does this work? Uh-oh, yeah, we won't do that again. Um, screw everything up. Uh, yeah, so, so the visual cortex is real important because we know that any compression going up in there, into that area, can lead to sort of visual field defects. Um, and okay, so this is a picture, so this is an MRI, and I'm sure that everybody's probably seen one. This is a sagittal cut. So if you take a, a cut from top down and look down, that's what we call a coronal section. And if you take it from side by, just right down the middle, so if you took the line right down my head here, and that gives us a great view to see what's going on. And this is right into the midbrain. And, and that, where we circled there is that little herniation. I've got a slide next to where you can really see how that's pressing into. So your radiologist is gonna be able to look at this and work with the neurology and be able to tell you if there's actually a, how much of a herniation is going down. And that way you can grade it and sort of that's gonna to lead to your treatment options. Uh, whether you need some kind of decompression surgery uh, or just watch it or, or shunning or whatever it is depending on the level of the MRI severity. So we, just, we, we touched on this a little bit. Syringia myelia uh, is basically a syrinx or a cavity of fluid that forms inside the spinal cord. Um, this, is a, this is a chronic condition and fluid, the spinal cord is constantly producing fluid. It can build up over time. As it builds up, it can lead to, to numbness, tingling, loss of muscle mass, muscle weakness, a decreased sensation, uh, chronic pain, spasm. So this is a real issue for patients. And a lot of times it's tied, it's, it's a secondary, it's, it's caused from a long-term fluid that can't get out of there because of the way the anatomy of the skull is based. Uh, the three most important components of diagnosing chiari malformation versus this syringomyelia is the complete case history, understanding when the symptoms are, when they started, um, the clinical exam and the, the signs that led by the patient, and then you, you almost always have to have some neuroimaging MRI to be able to distinguish between the two. Uh, and you can see the picture on your left was the one we showed earlier, where you can see the herniation coming down, and then this area here that they were able to shun out and stop that herniation to push everything back up where it belongs. So that was a, a pre and post for one of our patients that we saw that was having a lot of issues. Um, our, our neuro-ophthalmologist was able to kind of get these scans and work with them and then ended up in low vision and great outcome um, once the surgery and the shunning and all were done. They had lost pretty much all their peripheral visual field. Luckily, as everything got put back in place and uh, the, it wasn't long-term damage, it was just from inflammation, all the visual field re returned, which was a, a fantastic outcome. Uh, so. MRI scans are, are the, sort of the gold standard. It's a technique that uses magnetic field and radio waves. It's amazing what we can do with it. They have functional MRI now where they can actually make you think of an activity and do the test while you're doing it and try to pinpoint what parts of the brain are highlighting. Um, the sign MRI is uh, basically used for, for uh, chiar malformation because it's actually, they're watching cerebral spinal fluid while it's going live to see how much it's filling and not depending on what they're doing. So it's, a, it's I don't know if anybody's ever had one, but I've heard they're not that fun because you're, you're, you're in the MRI machine for a long time, but it does help with diagnosis management and that kind of thing. So, and I'm not, it, it, you, you can't even, I've never even seen a video of it. I've only read about it because I think the way it kind of goes is you have to be there watching it live to get the data. Um, so yeah, so, and then, X-rays can be helpful, CTs can be helpful just for bone abnormalities and things like that. So all that, that neuroimaging certainly helps when we're thinking about diagnosis and management. So this is what I do though, right? So, so they come in, how do you even get to that point? Well, during a comprehensive eye exam, we're gonna do a, a case history. That's probably 80% of your exam is done from that. 
What's the chief complaint? What's the history of present illness? Ocular history, functional complaints, uh, performance of activities of daily living, reading, headaches. Um, have they been in rehab? Is this a chronic problem or is this an acute problem? Observation, uh, what's their gait? How are they moving? Uh, clothing, facial appearance, what is their visual attention? Is there a head turn, a tilt? We're, we're, we're paying attention to all these clues as we're doing the eye exam. It's not just about looking at the eyeball. Uh, once we kind of get to the visual system, we test visual acuity. We use Snellen on an eye chart, but we also are checking contrast. We're checking, well, on that side, shapes, figures. You want to get some level of acuity. So if they don't know their letters or numbers, there are other ways in the exam to try to determine how well they see. Um, that's correct. And then we do pupils. Pupils are huge for any neurologic disease. Um, pursuits and scots, how do their eyes move? Do they jump? Can they fixate? Can they move and keep steady uh, their environment? Do their eyes work together? What's their color vision? What's their contrast? Uh, we do confrontational field testing. What's their visual feel like? You can do uh, hand motion, full to finger count, or if you notice that there's a deficit there, we have multiple ways to test uh, more threshold and, and visual field performance. Uh, in the slit lamp, we're looking at all the structures on the front surface of the eye, from the eyelids, the tear film, the, the cornea, the lens, which we'll talk about here in a little while. Um, you always want to make sure you're taking the intraocular pressure. That could be a sign of acute things going on, such as glaucoma. And I think we have a question about eye pressure, which we'll address in just a few minutes. And then we always dilate the eyes to look in the back um, to see what's going on. Obviously, in the case of Kari, we're looking to see if there's any swelling of the optic nerve or fluid pressing into the retina. So this is a great slide to kind of pinpoint how many uh, cranial nerves are associated with the midbrain. And all 12 of them have their base sort of right there. So if you have swelling of any area into the brain, cerebellum pressing up, it can affect pretty much any one of the 12 cranial nerves. Um, so when we're testing, obviously diplopia, eye turn, nystagmus, all these things sort of correlate back to where the lesion could be. So if we see this, then we're ordering special testing to get imaging to try to help us figure out what the diagnosis is based on the symptoms and the signs that we get in clinic. Um, due to the anatomy of the vision field, the brain, the malformations can present and the article okay. Um so we talked a lot about the occipital lobes, visual cortex. Occipital headaches are the most common symptoms. So when someone comes in, a lot of times it could be the eye exam might be the first trigger to, I'm having all this pain back here, but they've never been diagnosed with anything else. Well, that's gonna be a red flag to maybe get some more testing done. Um, that retrobulbar behind the eye pain, the blur vision, the photophobia, all those things we've already talked about. Nystagmus is the most common eye movement de deficit with uh, chiral malformation patients due to the location of the ocular motor vermis, which is where? In the cerebellum. And what's pushed down when we're talking through the foramen ovale? The cerebellum. So that's why you end up with nystagmus a lot once you have these sort of malformations that press in or, and are more developed. Um, and then hydrocephalus, uh, increased cerebrospinal fluid, intracranial hypertension. What that means is that the intracranial spinal fluid can't come down the spinal canal. It gets pressed back into the brain with too much compression in. It compresses all the way to the optic nerve. Uh, and this is just a slide kind of showing you the nerves um, that run up and down the back of the head and why that would make sense of when you're getting compression out and you're pressing on those nerves, it's going to lead to some neuralgia and headache pain. So you have the lesser and the greater right there. This talks a little bit about nystagmus. Um, it, it, most of the nystagmus we see is, is not acquired. Um, if you get a, so that means that you, they're born with this congenital. So if you get an acquired nystagmus, that's a red flag. Something's going on, uh, bells are going off, you're consulting with neurology right away. Um, but you're also, how are we gonna treat and manage this? So there's multiple ways you can. Well, first you gotta get the diagnosis. Treating the underlying uh, chiari malformation is the way you would treat someone with nystagmus from that but depending on what the cause is. And you can have lateral nystagmus, downbeat, upbeat, and whatever the, the level of nystagmus is, usually we can kind of tell what to start. So downbeat's usually midbrain. Um, uh, your higher functioning, your upbeat's usually uh, toxic, like alcoholism or something like that. Your lateral's almost always congenital. So depending on the way the eyes are moving, they're really a clue to us to, to what our next step is in our uh, triage of the patient. Photophobia, light sensitivity, very common. It's just from the pain, from all the muscles, all the inflammation in the brain going out. So we do have some filters. Uh, we do this in our low vision clinic a lot. We
We found that changing the wavelength going to the eye can make a big difference in the quality of how, how the person perceives light and can really be a game changer on uh, allowing them to be able to function behind a computer screen, uh, drive during the day, drive at night. So uh, there's a great study by the University of Utah on what's called FL41. It's a specific wavelength. It's like a boyish berry. It's sort of a blue-red kind of magenta sort of color that, that allows light to be blocked at a certain wavelength that people find very soothing. I'm not sure why that's the wavelength, but uh, we have found that multiple studies show that it's very beneficial. Diplopia, that's a, that's a tough one, right? So um, if it's truly from a compression of one of the, the cranial nerves, then you got to figure out which cranial nerve it is. You got to stop the compression. So usually there's some sort of brain surgery there. If it's a mild diplopia, we have prism. We can work prism so you can bend light rays on a pair of glasses to sort of match the images up. We can do uh, training. What this is called a Brock stream. So a mild diplopia or mild double vision. We can work eye exercises to help train the eyes to sort of work back together. So we do do a lot of that for these mild diplopia cases. Strabismus is uh, where you have an eye turn. So it's different than nystagmus because this is a constant turn. So if you have an eye that sort of kicks out all the time, that there could be compression of cranial nerve three or lateral rectus palsy or something like that. Those are, it happens a lot with diabetes and all, but it can happen with any disease. So when you find this, our goal is to first diagnose it and then try to manage it and treat it. Um, you saw, that was great. Juliana was doing exactly what I would have done. You patch one eye, you alternate the patches until, until the eyes sort of start to come back together. And if it's an acute process that's just uh, inflammation, they will always sort of come back and then we can start working that Brock string and eye exercises to help that. This is sort of the, the medical emergency from an eye, eye standard. Uh, it, obviously you have to treat uh, the underlying cause for that, but, but if you have intracranial hypertension and you have swelling at the level of the optic nerve, you're going to lose vision, all right? Now that, that's where Julianne was talking about. You're gonna have compression of your visual field and left untreated if the nerve swells. So this is what we call optical coherence topography. And it takes a picture of the optic nerve and it tells you how much swelling is that. And this eye is really swollen. And this person had horrible uh, intracranial hypertension from papilledema where the cerebral spinal fluid was so high, it was just pressing up. So these patients have to be managed right away. Um, you can do optic nerve fenestration, but usually getting them on Diamox and just trying to lower the cerebral spinal fluid and the pressure will start to bring this down and bring it back to normal. So any signs, this is an important reason that anybody with hydrocephalus or uh, any chiral malformation that has any sudden vision loss, they need to be seen right away. Any questions? Good, we'll keep going along then. So the ultimate treatment options depend on the symptoms. Uh, once uh, the disease progression impacts the symptoms for mild symptoms such as pain and headache, uh, medication, lifestyle alterations, avoiding weightlifting may be initiated. More severe, um, you may end up with a posterior fossa decompression. Uh, that's your neurosurgeons and your neurologists, but obviously uh, in the eye world, we're just trying to make sure that the, the eyes stay healthy, working with them and, and making them comfortable. And I, I've never seen, a, I've never, in the literature, there's a spinal laminectomy. I don't, is any, I'm not familiar very much with that, but, um, but obviously that can be it. And then the hydrocephalus of patients that I'm, I'm seeing a, a, pretty regularly in our clinic just to watch for optic nerve swelling or papilledema. So we'll switch gears. We'll go over to Ehlers-Danlos. So you go from an anatomical problem, uh, the way the, the body is, to now we're talking about a genetic problem of inheriting a genetic uh, disease process that affects connective tissues. Um, there's a lot of collagen in the eye, uh, almost every structure, your sclera, your retina, your lens, your zonular fibers that hold the lens, um, cornea, uh, basically, basically everything um, that, that kind of goes through is made up of collagen. So we know that Ehlers-Danlos affects collagen. Um, uh, muscles, ligaments, tendons, organs are all built from the structural level there. So that's why it affects so many different uh, processes in the body. Um, Y'all were talking about it early, and I'm not the expert, but you, there's six types, and I know that the hypermobile is, is the most common. But those, the vascular and the kyphoscoliosis are very important to distinguish, and we're going to talk about why. There's, there's one certain thing in the eye world that jumps out from one of these certain types that, that we have to watch for and have to make people aware of. 
Um, as we said, it's mostly autosomal dominant, uh, parents of inheritance, um, it's a mutant gene. These are some of the genes, y'all were talking about it in here while I was in here, there's a lot of genes and I think they're still trying to isolate more. So these are some of the ones that I was able to find uh, just doing a literature search. And uh, we're not gonna highlight that a lot, but obviously probably with everything else in the eye world and all, genetic therapies are gonna sort of be the key to, to fixing and, and curing this one day. Um, so type three, which is your hypermobile is the most common. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that because that's the one we tend to see in the eye clinic the most. So this is interesting, you kind of see all the way down. So autosomal dominant, but then you got recessive, recessive dominant, dominant. I have never seen a brittle cornea syndrome, but I, I, I'm interested because that's, that fits right in the eye world, right? So, but I don't, I'm not even sure what that is. I looked it up and there's not much about it, but obviously it's out there. Has anybody experienced that or have a friend or a colleague or read about it? No. All right, so we all know these probably already. Excessive mobile joints, chronic pain, uh, dysautonomia, which is a, it's an ANS, which is interesting how that affects the autonomic nervous system from a collagen disorder, but it happens a lot. Um, the chronic pain. So these are your, your systemic sort of symptoms going there. Um, but what we talk about eyes, we're going to jump into that. So what are some of the things with Ehlers-Danlos that we're looking at specifically uh, when they come in for an eye exam? Um, we're looking at the cornea specifically because the cornea is fully made out of collagen. It's a really beautiful design from the greater creator or whatever because the collagen is actually absolutely clear and it's because it's parallel and built like sheets and the way the collagen is. But we do know with uh, Ehlers-Danlos because it affects collagen that you can't have thinning of the cornea and if you have excessive thinning of the cornea that's a disease called keratoconus and we now have treatments to be able to manage that to stop progression and, and save vision from progressively worsening. We do an ocular topography because that tells us the shape and the size of the cornea and tells us if it's starting to thin. Pachymetry is, uh, measures the thickness of the cornea. So if you have progressive cornea disease, we'll watch that closely and if you start to see thinning, then we know treatment needs to be um, done. Because of the autonomic nervous system, the dysautonomia, pupil testing is super important. A lot of times you can pick up a, a autonomic nervous system problem by the pupils of the eyes. It's called an afferent pupillary defect. So if the pupils are reacting abnormal, that is a telltale sign something in the nervous system's off. Um, and, and obviously, because we were talking about the cornea in the college, um, Ehlers-Danlos patients are not candidates for LASIK or any refractive surgery that cuts or removes tissue from the cornea. Um, so I kind of I went through in the collagen structure of the eye like we were talking about. The cornea is that transparent tissue, fine collagen to a uniform diameter. The sclera is an opaque, very thick collagen, um, but you can have thinning of that, that bluish sclera that, that you can see. And if it thins too much, you're at risk for perforation. If your eye perforates, you're at risk for endophthalmitis and blindness. So certainly, certainly, certainly something we're going to watch for very closely. The vitreous body, the whole gel with hyaluronic acid is all made up of uh, collagen. Your lens capsule, and I'll go ahead and answer Nancy's question here, the lens capsule is the, the capsule surrounds the nucleus of the lens and that capsule is made up of all collagen. So you can end up with what's called a posterior subcapsular cataract because that capsule, that, that collagen can start to degenerate and once it degenerates, it starts to haze over and that's what leads to that po posterior subcapsular. So any part of your collagen with Ehlers-Danlos can be affected in the body. Um, and then we were talking about a retinal detachment. Certainly if you have thinning of the collagen, the, the fibroblasts and the collagen that build the, the matrix where the retina is, if that starts to thin, you're much higher risk for a retinal detachment. And the choroids, the, the part of the eye that sits behind that, that has a, a large co collagen base as well. So from front to back, from the very front of the eye to the cornea to the very back of the eye, the choroid, it's all collagen. So if you have thinning of any of those tissues, we're at risk of some level of eye complication. So your minor symptoms and signs, uh, eyelid, your, your eyelid laxicity, that can lead to dry eye. You can't close, you can't blink. Um, that blue sclera, uh, usually just something you watch, but if it gets so thin, there are treatments. Uh, you can go to steroids to stop inflammation. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do, but, but you watch it for thinning. Photophobia, the thin cornea like we talked about, the higher myopia, posterior staphylomas, the stretching of that collagen where you have a longer eye. Strabismus, angioid streaks can lead to choroidal neovascular membranes. Um, the potential serious concerns, uh, the biggest one you'll read about is uh, lens subsalization. Those zonular fibers in the eye, they get weak, they break, your natural lens drops. 
When that happens, you can't see number one, but if the lens doesn't get removed or get fixed quickly, that lens sitting back on the retina can cause long-term damage as well. Uh, glaucoma because of the nerve disease and then macular degeneration from the android streaks and uh, the breaks of the choroid and the vascular membrane. And then the emergency concern, which we'll talk about that, that specific type, that vascular Ehlers-Danlos, um, you can end up with a carotid cavernous fistula. That's where the blood vessel, the arteries and the veins start to leak right behind the eyes. Those blood vessels leak, leaks into the brain. You can end up with an aneurysm. So just some examples of eyelid laxicity. You can see this guy on the left, how stretchy it is. His eyes aren't going to blink. When they don't blink that well, the natural prep compression of my bummy glands and tear film is lost. So the eyes become very dry. Long-term dry can lead to corneal disease. Um, there are a lot of ways to, to manage this. This is just one way. It's called a blepharoplasty. So if you have that much laxicity, our oculoplastic surgeons here at MUSC can take and tighten up some of that tissue to, to make it so it's more, not as lax, so you have better control of your tear film and your eyelid. Um, so that's sort of how they do that. My dad just had it done. So it was a good outcome, I hope. I hope he's happy. Um, yeah, so. The blue sclera, I hope you can tell in the picture, they're a little bit blue, you can kind of tell. So, so what, what, why does that happen, right? So what makes the eye blue? Well, um, as, the collar, as the sclera starts to thin out, you have all, your whole arterial and venous blood supply behind that whiteness that we see in the sclera. So as that thins out, you're able to see the, the uh, purple or, or blue veins, and that's what you're seeing whenever you think about the blue sclera. You're actually seeing the underlying vasculature that underlies that white scleral collagen tissue. And again, you watch this, but if it gets too thin and you're risk for perforation, uh, they have patches, they have grafts, um, you can go to steroids. So there are ways to maintain this, but you gotta diagnose it and watch it closely. High myopia is a big concern. Um, the higher myopia for every diopter you have higher, so after about a minus six, seven, eight, nine, your risk of retinal detachment, cataracts, um, macular degeneration, everything goes up much higher. So. Uh, we, we've got this huge, we call it an epidemic of myopia across the world, especially with more screen time and younger kids. So we know that we're trying to control that more. So you'll probably hear in the national media in the next year or two, a big push to help, try to help control myopia from getting worse, because all the studies show that the higher and higher it gets, the more at risk we are for eye disease as you get older. Uh, y'all can, no one can miss that. Y'all can do an eye exam and not miss that. Um, your, your lens, if it falls down, one, you're not going to be able to see, but, it, but it's, it's not good. So basically when that happens, you just remove it, and then they're going to do a, uh, they're going to either put an anterior lens that can't move or they'll suture it into it. And they've got some pretty cool procedures now. But again, the reason you got to get this fixed quickly is if that lens goes back to the eye, it can lead to retinal attachment and other things. This, this by itself is not a blinding condition. This is very easily fixed as long as it's called early and managed well. I see a lot of this in my specialty clinic. Um, this is called keratoconus. It's a thinning of the cornea where it becomes cone-like and as, as the cornea starts to scar over, light can't get through it. Uh, we try to catch it before they need a corneal transplant. Uh, Ehlers-Danlos patients, because the cornea is already weak, the collagen at the cornea, they're not great transplant patients. So a corneal transplant. So we try to, we try to catch it early and manage it. And there's a lot of ways we can do that. Corneal cross-linking, we can put them in lenses that protect the front surface of the eye so it's not constantly, we, we try to preach, 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 no eye rubbing, things like that. But this is one of the eye diseases that we see every day in clinic. Um, and it's not always the collagen disorder, this can be, but it's a very, it's a secondary finding we can see with Ehlers Danlos. Retinal detachment, uh, Juliana said her, her grandfather had it. Um, they're very common. We see them every week. Obviously, um, this is just something you want to be on the lookout for. Um, does anybody know the three major symptoms or signs that you would see with the retinal attachment? Does anybody review them? Is it flash, flashing? Flashing, yep. Flashes of light. There's two more. An onset of floaters. Not like one big floater, but like a shaking snow globe, right? Yeah. And, and the big, the telltale one is if you see a black curtain or shadow in your vision and that shadow does not go away after about 20 minutes and it continuously progresses, that's a get to the ED or emergency department or, or call your local eye doctor. You gotta get seen within 24 hours. Because if you catch a retinal detachment while it's happening, you can treat, manage it, and save vision. If you wait, 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 um, and the macula gets separated, you're probably not gonna have good vision uh, uh, no matter what kind of surgery they do. So, good, glad you knew that. Uh, and this is, the, this is sort of the medical emergency that, uh, that just kind of the take home message of all this is, um, 
that 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 bastard kind it can affect the the uh, uh, carotid cavernous, which is right behind the eyes, and, and you can see it a lot of different ways. But a lot of times, patients will come in and they'll have like a throbbing. They can actually feel their eye throbbing, and that's a uh oh. All right, let's make sure we go. Let's go slow and make sure we look at everything. Um, but the high pressure from the internal carotid artery passes directly behind the veins. It potentially breaks and combines into the blood vessels, and then you end up with an aneurysm. Once that aneurysm breaks, um, it's bad. So, so it's basically the cavernous, that's the cause, but the, the death is due to an aneurysm of a stroke. So, um, and this, because uh, seek immediate hospital-based medical attention and inform emergency medical staff of vascular EDS and the risk. So if anybody has that or, or you, you have that come up in the group uh, at future meetings, just make sure that they know about this, to, to ha have them look it up, make sure they understand the, the um, symptoms of it, and if it ever happens, to get seen right away. With that, I think, just what I said, so um, that's it. Um, so chiro malformation and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome may have many symptoms that can include ocular manifestations and it's important to understand them. Uh, during a comprehensive eye exam, it's more than just checking your vision. It helps point to systemic problems past the level of the eye. Symptoms can range from minor to life-threatening, so the importance of a case history, clinical signs and symptoms cannot be understated. Luckily, every eye condition covered in this presentation can be watched and treated if needed, thus the importance of annual dilated eye exams. So, with that, I'd love to take any questions. Don't make them hard. Yes. I have a question. Yeah. The lens dislocation, what would be the early symptoms of that? It's acute. It is. It's acute. So, there's not many symptoms. There's not much going on because once the zinulars break, that it breaks and falls. So there, it's like hanging on by a thread and you don't even know your button's about to fall off your shirt because uh, you might can feel it, but inside the eye, you're not gonna have many warning signs. So it's gonna be that cute drop of vision that came out of nowhere. Yeah, unfortunately. And there's no way to go in and switch to tighten those zonules up. So it's sort of a wait and know it can happen, but when it happens, know to get seen right away. And there was a question about eye pressure. So, so eye pressure is important. Uh, I think the, the, the question from the, the audience was, if you, if her pressure had gone from 15 to 19. Well, 15 to 20 and it is a normal eye pressure, right? So, so that by itself is an isolated finding that I'm not too concerned about. Like if your pressure's 30, that's a lot different. Um, but it's the other symptoms, it's getting the dilated eye exam, it's making sure that you check the optic nerve, you check the pressure. Is there a family history of glaucoma? Um, is there any damage at the level of the retinal nerve fiber layer? But pressure itself, is, it's a closed system, so there's not much you can do to, to fix it unless it's too high, and then we start treating and managing it. But those subtle changes, it's sort of like a, your heart rate can kind of go up and down, but 15 to 20 is normal, so I wouldn't be too concerned about that. But over about six or seven times, if it's trickling up, 15, 19, 24, 28, 29, that's more concerning and you definitely want to manage it. Um, and that's more of just a general eye thing. I don't think that's directly correlated to Ehlers-Danlos or chiro malformation because the eyeball is a closed system. It's fluid being produced and removed at the same time. So if that fluid you make too much, it causes compression into the eye. So that's, that's a separate system, but certainly a great question and just make sure she's following up routinely with that. Yes, sir. What percentage of your clinic is EDS or Chiari? Uh My clinic, not, you know, I, Probably five a week out of maybe a hundred. I see about 40 patients a day, so you know that's a pretty, pretty, pretty small percentage. Um, but whenever they come in, you do see it with problems, though. I mean, a lot, a lot of my more symptomatic vision issues have, have those conditions. And chiro malformation, certainly in my low vision, but that's a, that's a secondary, that's the cause, but it's usually the optic nerve condition with the swelling that we see to manage that from a low vision standpoint. Yes? What are floaters? What can cause them and how serious are they? They are not serious. So, um, so a vitreous floater is, so, so that's the collagen of the back of the eye, so the hyaluronic acid. So as we age, our vitreous, uh, it, it, when you're born, it's 100% gel. And every decade, that gel liquefies about 10%, right? So right now, I'm 40, I'm sitting at 60% gel, 40% liquid, but your, your, your collagen and the, the hyaluronic acid is consistently shrinking. And as it shrinks, it sort of breaks apart and creates little globules. 
And what will happen is those little globules are floating around in our dissolved vitreous. And when light hits it just right, you're seeing, you're actually seeing the shadow of that little gel ball. Now, that goes back to a retinal detachment. A vitreous floater by itself is absolutely benign. It's going to happen. You're going to get more and more as you age as the eye just gets older and, and uh, that vitreous dissolves. But as long as it doesn't pull at the retina and lead to a tear, break, or detachment, that's a normal age-related change. Annoying, but not sight-threatening or anything to worry about. Yes, ma'am. Really random question. <laughs> when I was in high school, I had this situation happen where I passed out in the middle of the night, some sort of syncopal episode, and I woke up and I couldn't see. And the the um, the EMTs came and eventually my vision came back and I've never had another incident like that, but I just thought it was so weird. And I don't know what would cause So, you, you know, Juliana was saying during her thing um, about the, she was seeing those images in her vision and, and that to me, and she has migraines, she has a migraine a day. That's almost certainly what she's talking about, what's called a migraine aura. And my guess if yours was a sword symptom after some tra traumatic thing and it lasted for, what, how long did it last? 20 minutes? Um, I don't remember. It may be about 20 minutes, so, but I couldn't see anything. Yep. So we can have, and I'm going to show you this, because I, I showed this to patients. The Mayo Clinic did a great job on uh, explaining sort of what a visual aura is. Um, it's not an eyeball problem. It's actually a neurologic phenomenon that happens when you're, um, when the brain has a chemical wave or electronic or electrochemical wave that goes over the visual cortex. A migraine headache is caused by changes in your nervous system. Migraines may progress through four stages, prodrome, aura, attack, and postrome. Not everyone experiences all the stages. 40 to 60% of people with migraines experience a prodrome phase, subtle changes one or two days preceding the attack. This may include constipation, depression, diarrhea, drowsiness, food cravings, or hyperactivity and irritability. Alternatively, you might not notice any symptoms. About 20% of people with migraines experience a more distinct migraine warning sign in the second phase called the migraine aura. Auras are usually visual, but can also be sensory, motor, or verbal disturbances. Visual auras are most common. A visual aura is like an electrical or chemical wave that moves across the visual cortex of your brain. The visual cortex is the part of your brain that processes visual signals. As the wave spreads, you might have visual hallucinations. The best known visual aura is called a fortification spectrum because its pattern resembles the walls of a medieval fort. It may start as a small hole of light, sometimes bright geometrical lines and shapes in your visual field. This visual aura may expand into a sickle or C-shaped object with zigzag lines on the leading edge. As it moves, it may appear to grow. Auras are not the same for all people, so you also might experience bright spots or flashes. Auras are sometimes accompanied by a partial loss of vision, referred to as a scrotoma. That's what I would, I would assume, a you know, one-off, if it's never come back and, and you're having any kind of a trigger on that. Um, I've had a lot of people come in where they had one, one aura and never had it again. And, and it's a diagnosis of exclusion, but everything else is healthy. So I don't know what to make of it other than assume if it's a short acting time. And I do have patients that will tell me they're riding down the road and all of a sudden, boom, everything's sort of gone. And that's that scotoma until sort of the, everything kind of calms down, they get back. And, and almost always you can figure out you're, you're under high stress or you had, there was some trigger that led to that. And, and obviously I'm not sure about your case, but usually when you, you go through the clinical history and you talk through it enough, you find that that sort of is probably what's going on. And again, it's not an eyeball, it's just not something to worry about. It's neurological, one off, okay. If they continue and you start to see that over and over, you, you probably need to have an MRI and make sure there's nothing uh, in the brain that's, that's triggering this as a more constant um, phenomenon. Does that answer? Does that, hopefully that helps. It's the best I got for you without knowing anything else. Um, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned that floaters are going to happen as you age. Um, what's the age that you All the time. Do we need yeah, to go to? You want to go to my office? Uh, we'll go to the clinic right now if you want. No. Yeah. You probably. I mean, when's the last time you had? Seriously, when's the last time you had a dilated eye exam? Um, about eight months ago. 
Yeah, so that sounds like if you're getting the flashes, you're basically having the symptom of the vitreous separating from the retina. Right. So, so again, if it doesn't fully separate, there's no, there's no one going to operate or try to make it happen faster. But for you, it goes back to the same symptoms. That's, that sounds like the vitreous is sort of tugging, ready to come off. And a lot of times it'll just, once it separates off, you're going to see this big glob and it's going to be annoying for a little while. And then slowly it's going to get smaller and, and drop in your line of sight. Because the vitreous, again, it's always shrinking and gravity is going to take it down. But if it pulls the retina, you're going to notice those symptoms, but they don't come and go. Remember, if you're having a retinal attachment, those symptoms are constant and they're not going to go away. So, so just be on the, that's where you just got to be cognizant. Don't go ride bumper cars or do head soccer balls or anything right now. Cause that's the stuff that can like, you know, really jar it and, and, and separate it bad. So you want it to slowly just sort of natural separate and 99.9% .9 of the time, that's what happens. So, but yeah, get, get, go get a dilated eye exam sooner than later. I would say just to make sure there's not a hole because if you got a tear going on right now, that's treatable. But, but the only way to diagnose that is to get a good dilated exam and look out in the peripheral retina. And they probably didn't see anything, right? Yeah, if there's no hole breaker tear, they're not going to just start lasering it because of symptoms, right? You've got to see an active something to, to manage it. Otherwise, it's just, it's just you've got to self-monitor very closely and understand what the risk and the symptoms are. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Well, annual for sure, and again, it goes back to dryness and all that. Again, you, so it, going back to that, for all, anybody I see that has a diagnosis, again, we're, we're doing corneal topography, pentacam, and pachymetry. We're doing baseline, and then we're watching for progression. So those are the things you can do. We can watch certain things to look for, for that. Prophylactically, unfortunately, um, if, if it's thinning, you can get what's called corneal cross-linking to stop that thinning, right? Um, but, but as far as lenectopia prophylaxis, I think it's just being careful and understanding and understanding all the symptoms and, and what you're looking for and knowing if something's off to get seen right away and try to know. And I know we all want to try to be proactive, not reactive, but unfortunately there's just no great. And, and I think just going back to the, the ultimate line is going to be to see if you can change the collagen. Is there anything with stem cell therapy or anything that can help the connective tissue become less brittle, right? So I think that's the underlying cause there, but but now it's sort of just watching and understanding what can happen and be ready to to go if you need to. So like this, I vitamins are difference. I vitamins are so so I vitamins are uh, the A reds is the only proven one, and A reds is the age related eye disease study. If you have any, what the study says is if you have any early signs of AMD, drusen, uh, angioid streaks, anything like that in your eye, then A reds 50% of the time can stop progression of uh, developing age-related macular degeneration. So if you have a family history or you have any signs, yes, absolutely, we recommend AREDs starting, stay on them, they're cheap, it's a, and we know it was studied for, it was a, about 200,000 people were in the study. So we got good clinical data that says it worked. Um, uh, dry eye drops, I mean, you, things to just routine maintenance, but for eye health, um, you know, omega-3 we know helps stimulate your glands, which gives you a better tear film, so that can help, but there's no magic bullet. It's, it's more of eating right, avoiding wind blowing at your eyes, some, some just simple things like that. Anybody else? Good, cut it. All right, seven, we, we went just at 50 minutes, so. Well, thank y'all for being a great audience. Hopefully you learned a little bit.